Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, and uh, so this is the Special Mix Seminar Series 5. And we will start soon uh, preparing the sixth one. And we have some speakers also lined up. And today we are very happy to have Dr. Akhil Mershon uh, from uh, uh, Cedar Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And uh, he will be talking about single cell architecture of the immune microenvironment in lymphoma. And uh, a quick uh, background for Dr. Mershon is, um, so he received his Bachelor of Arts in Rice University, then MD from Baylor College of Medicine. And after that, he worked at Baylor as an internal medicine, med medicine resident. And following uh, at Johns Hopkins, he uh, worked as, uh, as a fellow and an instructor before starting at the University of Southern California as an assistant professor of medicine. And he's recently an associate professor and director of imaging mass cytometry shared resource at Cedars Sinai Medical Center. And without further ado, I'd like to turn over to Dr. Akhil Mershon, please. Great, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. So, um, uh, you know, I think uh, this talk will hopefully be a little uh, different uh, than, than some of the really great sort of cutting edge technology talks that we've heard, because uh, I'm not really a technologist. I'm not here to tell you about a new method. This is a commercial method, but we're sort of trying to take it to say, what can we do with this and how can this inform biology or, and actually even patient care? So I'm gonna actually start uh, talking about lymphoma, but I'm gonna start from the pathologist's point of view, because in one way, sort of pathologists were like the original spatial tissue spatial folks, right? I mean, that's what a pathologist does. So largely what they do is involve the spatial architecture of tissues. Um, and so those who might not be familiar with pathologists see, so uh, this is sort of a, a, a lymph node or lymph node specimen that will be embedded in paraffin. This is important. All the stuff I'm gonna show you is from um, uh, formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue, which is still the standard for clinical um, specimen processing and uh, is sometimes a limitation some of these novel uh, spatial techniques, of course, we've heard about um, require fresh tissue or specially prepared tissue. So, so for clinical translation, that can become limiting. Um, but what a, what a pathologist does is they get this embedded in wax and it's sliced into five micron sections. And they might get a deck of slides in a little cardboard box that looks like this. Um, and then do a couple of things. They look at the morph, they look at uh, what's an HNE standard, hemotoxin acid, and they can see patterns and morphology of cells. And they can do immunohistochemistry, which is an antibody-based method to look at certain proteins. And then they do their diagnostic process that way. Um, if there are any pathologists or anybody familiar with immunology in the group, just probably on this h &E, you could guess that this is a lymph lymphoid tissue by the follicle structure. Um, and you could probably even guess what these two patterns or what these two proteins I'm standing for. In the bottom, I'm standing for CD20, which marks the B cells, which is the, the, sort of the follicles. And uh, uh, the one above is CD3, which marks T cells, which marks the spaces in between. So even just trying to emphasize how powerful spatial patterning is to, to identifying tissues and, 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 their, and their state and function. Of course, the limitations when you do the, uh, these methodologies, you can't look at multiplex markers and most immunology and immune classification requires multiplex markers. Uh, Lymphoma classification also requires immunophenotyping, unlike say sort of other solid tumors, which largely are diagnosed on the HNE. So I'm gonna talk about a type of lymphoma called diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Uh, and and it's sort of, uh, the name sort of tells you what you need to know about, about uh, lymphoma and the things that pathologists do. So sort of very broadly, the way lymphoma is classified is by the tissue pattern. Um, as we heard just now, we're discussing follicular versus diffuse. And that's the first um, column here. My mouse seems to close in. Um, there we go. Um, so the, 
Okay, so the first column is the tissue pattern, and you can see this is a follicular lymphoma and they make follicles, although this is cancerous. And in the diffuse pattern, you don't see that, you just see sheets of cells, um, hence the name. Um, then the cellular morphology. So you zoom in and these cells would be considered small with dark nuclei, and these are very large cells with open nuclei and, 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 and lots of cytoplasm. So these would be a large cell versus a smaller cell. This is also from a follicular lymphoma. And then the cell identity, in this case by protein, this is a marker for CD20 here in the bottom, um, which marks these as B cells. So the name diffuse large B cell lymphoma is based on this, what the pathologist sees. And diffuse large B cell lymphoma is the most common type of lymphoma and is uh, uh, curable on about half, half of patients, but uh, half of the patients that come to their treatment and there's certain variability to that. Um, but until I would say about 20 years ago, this morphologic, this pattern here was the sum total classification. Um, and that all changed with a paper out of Lustout in the NCI, this is, and, and Ash Elizabeth, this is in 2000. And this uh, was sort of one of the first papers to talk about its different subtypes. And I think probably one of the first papers in cancer, because this was using actually um, spotted cDNA arrays, so really ancient technology. Uh, and what they were able to do is derive gene expression patterns that divided DL, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, or DLBCL, which I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the talk, into sort of two broad classifications. One that resembled uh, normal cells of the germinal center, again, harkening back to these normal counterparts, and others that resembled B cells which had been activated, so activated B cell light and germinal center light, GC and ABC for activated B cell. And these broad patterns were important because they were able to now separate DLBCL into different prognostic groups. And again, this was one of the first uses of gene expression to do that in, I think, in any cancer. It's only the first one that I, that, that I remember, but definitely one of the, certainly the one pioneering the field. Um, since then, there's been a lot of evolution. Uh, this is a paper from Margaret Shipp's group, uh, almost at the same time, there's another paper from Lou Stout's group doing roughly the same thing. And here, this is sort of much more in this decade where we're losing, using um, uh, different uh, mutations to classify lymphoma. And in this paper, they classified the lymphoma into sort of three broad categories. And you can see, if you look at, and I've zoomed in, so you can't see all of it, but, you know, BCL6 is a common translocation, it's really driving cluster one, P53 mutations in cluster two. But you can also see that, that there's a relationship between what we're seeing, obviously, with the gene expression and mutations, not surprisingly, because if you look at the cell of origin, which is that ABC, GCB classification I mentioned before, um, cluster three, which is mutationally defined, and cluster four are really enriched in this GCB phenotype, while cluster five is really enriched in ABC phenotype. And it turns out there are mutations here that are related to the B cell signaling complex, which would go along with an activated B cell phenotype, which sort of makes a lot of biological sense. Some of the genetic clusters don't quite match up exactly. And this is an interesting sort of challenge in classification. Um, the NCI group does gene expression and then molecular and, and sort of there are different ways to go about it. But this is sort of the state of the art currently in, in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And so our hypothesis was, could we do multiplex spatial imaging to further refine this, to define new subgroups and to correlate with these existing patterns that we see. So I'm gonna have two slides on the technology because I'm sure everyone here is pretty familiar. The basic conceit for mass cytometry is you get around the challenge of fluorochrome overlap by using uh, isotopically purified mass tags rather than fluorochrome. So you can do much more multiplexing uh, and, and you don't have the spectral overlap problem that you would with fluorochromes. And this is from the original uh, description of the method from, from the paper of Ada Bodenmiller's lab. Uh, and basically the, those who aren't familiar, our methodology uses tissue sections exactly like I showed you that the pathologist might have. 
same thickness, same paraffin embedded formalin fixed tissue. Um, and we use antibodies that are uh, tied with the mass, uh, with the isotope with pure masses uh, and uh, stain. Uh, the, the staining is, uh, it, it inherits all the peculiarities of the antibody. So if you have a good antibody, it stains well. If you have a non-specific antibody, it's gonna do that same thing as well. Um, and then the real, the sort of innovation here is using a raster UV laser um, to release the uh, material in a pulsatile way, which is then fed into a cytoph to give you um, pixel by pixel or one micron uh, area, uh, ablation area as individual units, which can be reconstructed into, into patterns and images and cells that can be analyzed. Uh, segmentation is required to release the single cell data. Um, I'm not gonna talk about segmentation, which is its own important field. We have, so this data, we use the, the pipeline as published by Bowden Miller using um, um, elastic uh, cell profiler, that sort of workflow. There are other workflows that we are exploring and, and others have described, but the elastic works. It's a little tedious is the only real problem. It requires a lot of manual training, but it works and it works for us. And that's what all these data are based on. So the study I'm gonna to talk to you about is uh, from this paper that we were just discussing in the beginning that we've been, uh, been had a preprint up <clears throat> and we've been working on, on getting it uh, published, but um, it's about 33 cases of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma arrayed on a tissue microarray. So those who aren't familiar with the tissue microarray, basically um, you take those blocks that I showed you at the beginning, at the beginning and take a, at least case, two millimeter core and array them in a new block. And then you can use that single block to stain and ablate and it allows for um, you know, batch treatment uh, uh, staining to sort of minimize batch effects when you do that. So this is a, a tissue microarray um, and these are the actual uh, H&E images to show, you can already tell from this magnitude, from even from this sort of low power view, there's a lot of heterogeneity that we're gonna look at. So, you know, as our first pass, um, we did a lot of work sort of phenotyping the cells um, and sort of clustering them. We use the phenograph clustering, metaclustering method. And I'll go through this quickly because I, everyone really wants to talk about the spatial aspects, which I'll, which I'll get to in just a second. Not surprising, the majority of cells are tumor, but we do see a lot of different immune cells, which appear in the main cardinal types you might see in the microenvironment, with some endothelial cells, macrophages, CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, and regulatory T cells, sort of as broad groups summarized here. Again, the majority of it's tumor, which is sort of consistent with the pattern, but there's quite a, a bit of, of, of microenvironment that's highly variable uh, from, from very low amounts of microenvironment to, to very, high two to almost two to one immune cell to tumor cell, depending on, on the specific case. Um, and so I'll just show you uh, sort of just one aspect of, uh, of what we did with this multiplex before we get into the spatial is so um, uh, this is actually an image of what that microarray looks like when you stain it for immunohistochemistry. Uh, and this is, this is, I should mention, work done with Imran Siddiqui who, 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 who's a pathologist who originally collected this cohort. And, and what he was able to show is when he looked at one marker of interest, for example, PDL1, which is a marker related to immune checkpoint and immune response, um, it, he was able to separate the cohorts based on high PDL1 expression of greater than 30%, had a much poorer outcome than patients who had less PDL1 expression. And of course, when we took this um, with, uh, with looking at several markers, um, uh, we were able to sort of this, do this triple positive score. And this is all within the single cell, which is, you know, why we multiplex. And we were able to sort of improve on that, even that same cohort, our classification is now much uh, uh, more discrete and really to separate these groups into, into very, uh, very good and sort of much more poor prognosis, sort of illustrating the importance of multiplexing uh, within this context. Um, and, and when we compared it to sort of the current clinically used classifiers, such as the, the Hans, as I mentioned, which is, this is the, the, the um, uh, C index, um, which, you know, predicts how good this is as a biomarker. 
uh, one being a perfect biomarker and zero being a, 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 not a useful one. Anything above 0.7 is generally considered a useful biomarker. The IPI is um, the International Prognostic Index, which is a constellation of prognostic factors. That's sort of, that's the one that's used clinically. And we can see that, that the IPI, you know, obviously does well, but when we add some of our, 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 our IPI plus the pattern, we can improve on that. Um, and, and, uh, uh, and if we uh, use just a spatial model, which, which I won't talk about today, uh, based on CD8 uh, uh, spatial features, you can actually improve as well. So these, these are very reasonable predictors um, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, for, for, for clinical, potentially clinical use. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously this is a small group. So, so before we say that it's a useful predictor, we need to validate that. So that's actually kind of what's holding the paper. So we're doing to repeat this on a larger cohort, um, but certainly in terms of conceptually how we can use multiplex imaging to generate biomarkers certainly is a very intriguing approach. Okay. And to go back to what I was saying at the beginning is that we can actually try to map these immunophenotypes um, and this is actually now subsetting the regulatory T cells of CD4 cells, CD8 cells into, in, into sort of finer groups based on all the different markers that are ex expressed. And you can actually uh, find um, very nice enrichments or depletions of these immunophenotypes um, that correlate with the genetic groups that others have, have defined. So this is that C1 through C5 that I walked you through at the beginning, that's a genetic classifier. Uh, we applied that classifier to our cases. We had the mutation information. And you can see that there's certain patterns of the CD8 um, subset here, CD8 sub five, um, that is, that is um, highly enriched in, in, in the C4 and C5 group, which if you remember, corresponds also to the GC uh, phenotype by sort of the original cell of origin. You can also see um, relative depletions of certain phenotypes. Uh, this is a certain regulatory phenotype, a highly proliferative or activated regulatory T cell, which actually is probably interferon gamma producing, not really suppressive. Um, and these are actually relatively depleted in, in, in uh, C5, which is the ABC type and C1 group, which was the uh, BCL6 group. group. So um, really, really nice um, and reassuring that um, uh, gene expression defined groups obviously have correlation with genetic groups, which makes biological, biological sense, which also you can find correlations with different immune groups and immune uh, cells in the microenvironment, suggesting sort of a coherent biological process and perhaps allow us to sort of, sort of um, get more insight into that. Um, so our first pass at sort of spatial analysis was simply to, to sort of look at how um, um, cells in proximity to tumor cells might enrich for certain phenotypes. Um, so uh, one of the things that we were able to do is um, link these embryo phenotypes to chemotherapy response. Um, so for example, uh, patients who are refractory, meaning they did not get a remission to standard chemotherapy or they relapsed right away, that's a very bad thing. Uh, and, and those patients do very poorly or versus patients who, who get a, uh, you know, a long remission. And you could see that if we just do globally, there was enrichment for certain phenotypes. This regulatory T cell phenotype was enriched in patients who are refractory as was this M2, which is a thought to be an immunosuppressive macrophage phenotype. But there was a phenotype that was very interesting to us is this PDL1 positive M2 macrophage that has the markings of an M2 macrophage, but also highly expresses PDL1. And PDL1 on macrophages is thought to be very important for the immune checkpoint response or inhibition of the immune checkpoint among T cells and inhibiting immune response. And We'd hope to see that this was actually highly enriched, but when we look globally, it actually wasn't. Um, but when we actually then restrict the analysis to say 10 microns within uh, uh, the tumor, you see that there's actually a very robust enrichment 
of these PDL1 M2 macrophages. Um, and so what we're hoping to try to get to is because these are always going to be, you know, these are within the human patient. They're not perturbed. So mechanism is always sort of at best implied or we can sort of correlate. You have to do that in, in, in the sort of model system. But um, the, sort of the conceit is that if things are directly related or directly interacting, they'll be closer than things that are not, right? <clears throat> so if PDL1 positive macrophage, PDL1 positive N2 macrophages are modulating <clears throat> chemo responsiveness <clears throat> in lymphoma, <clears throat> then they would directly, then they would do so by being physically closer to the tumor cell. And so we were very excited to see that. So <clears throat> we wanted to then try to do this globally. <coughs> so to do that globally, we um, sort of tried to come up with a, a metric that could analyze patterns and structures in the lymphoma um, uh, sort of in a global way. And so in most solid tumors, people have looked at this immune pattern, immune spatial analysis. They um, inherit information from uh, the architecture of the tumor. So if anybody has done this work and looked at it, you'll see things where people say, you know, in the tumor or outside the tumor or on the tumor interface or in the stroma. Um, but those terms aren't relevant to DLBCL. DLBCL grows as sheets. And it's, you can't define those things just by looking at them or by sketching them out. Um, yet we know there's some heterogeneity there. And so our first effort was to try to see if we could, based on single cell interactions between tumors and their immune cells, just do a simple classification. And so this is a pretty simple idea is that you take, say, a cell of interest here in this tumor cell, and you measure the distance to the five uh, nearest neighbors, as well as the distance to the centroid of those five nearest neighbors. And you will get a sense not only of, um, obviously, the distance to immune cell, but a distance to, uh, if, if the distance between, say, the tumor and the immune cell is very close and the distance between the centroid and the immune cell is very close and the cell immune cell, uh, the tumor cell is sort of inside or encased within immune cells uh, versus if it's more scattered and you can have a distance between a tumor and immune cell uh, that is that is much less than the distance of the centroid you have immune cells that are patterned around uh, but not necessarily sort of surrounding um, there are different ways to do this people this is have done this in in, in other ways but the concept is all similar as you're trying to measure distances to various genotypes. We do this across all the phenotypes we defined previously. Um, so, so to see if this even would work, we went to something that we know a lot about the structure. We went to a normal lymph node. And so this is just, we picked an area that's sort of, is pretty, pretty diverse. And so you can see that in a normal lymph node, you have both clusters of B cells and follicles here. And this is CD20. And this is sort of uh, sort of scattered B cells, as well as germinal center, which will have a ring of tightly packed B cells in what's called a mantle zone, and then in the germinal center where there's sort of activation. Uh, and I've shown you two other markers here uh, to sort of help orient you. So in this area here in the germinal center, um, proliferation happens at one end, and clusters of what are called T follicular helper cells, in this case marked by PD1, um, are at the other end. And so the light and the dark zones within, within the uh, follicle, within the germinal center. And so you can see this sort of pattern is here. So we, so we know these structures, we know that, and there's B cells all around, right? Because you can see that from here. So our, if this works, if this is able to classify these different B cells, we should be able to recapitulate these structures that we see just by looking at um, the different cells that are around those B cells, right? And so when we do that, we get a cluster pattern um, uh, of different B cells. So what we've done here is marked 
all the non-B cells, it, uh, here you see the, the color T, the T cells and CD4 and CD8 cells. And then the rest of the cells, these sort of black and yellow, uh, as well as these different blue, are all different T B cell populations that are grouped, are classified based on their distance to other cells. And what you see right away is you, you can recapitulate the structures that, that you see, and these are being classified as different, and they correspond to the mantle zone. And then these different B cells are clustered differently because they're light and dark zone B cells. And this is not based on, like for example, the KI67 expression, which would also be another way to do it, but just simply on their pattern. So, um, so we sort of thought that this at least was a reasonable approach and lymph node was able to classify B cells and so, or, or, or CD20 cells. So we approached it to our sort of cohort of lymphoma. Um, and this is really right, this is the challenge all of us have is you've got all these really neat ways of measuring features on a spatial basis, but how do we organize that back into information about tissue and about function, about biology? And so this was our attempt to do so. And so what you see is um, we sort of, we get all these distance metrics and then we cluster them and say, you know, do they make sense or do they have a pattern that, that, that is, that is um, that sort of makes sense to us. And so this is the actual distances, average distance from to the nearest immune cell in these different clusters. And so B, A, E, and G were very similar. Um, and this cluster D was sort of the one that was sort of distinct and had um, a large distance. And so what that looks like is actually, we try to color code it here to show you what that image looks like. So in this area here, you can see that they're scattered in this, in, in this image, different um, cells that are of that B, A, so you can see finally blue cells and gray cells here, here, here. And basically the distance is short because there's lots of immune cells. And you can see that certainly in here. And, and I think if this was a solid tumor, you would just say, this is the tumor here in the tan and the gray, and this is just stroma, but that's not the case. All of this is tumor. If I, if I showed you, a CD20 image, this is actually just all tumor, but there's very subtle differences because uh, these aren't big distances. This is about, you know, 12 is the average maybe here. And, uh, and just over, it's about 48 is the, is, is the average here. So really not big dis in micron distances, but, you know, it's a, it's a sort of really distinct pattern that starts to emerge. So these areas that were D and F, which are sort of this, here's D and here's F, remind us a lot of, um, what you might imagine um, um, the earth and it's, it's, sort of, it's, it's sort of core and the mantle and the crust. And we actually use those terms in the paper to sort of to define that. But basically deep in the center here, you have a really immune uh, desert region as you might he have heard of that term. You have this interface here where there's lots to be a lot of immune cells. Um, they call this the crust. And then you have this dispersed or outer space, this sort of area way out here where you have a lot of interaction with immune cells. So that's great. I can show you a pattern. Doesn't mean anything. So that's so. Before I show you that, um, we first thought that well, we sort of see these patterns. Does it have any relationship to uh, sort of structures in general? So this Clark Evans statistic is a, is a nice way to sort of say how are there repeating structural patterns in a tissue, right? So if you take just a normal lymph node, and this is the lymph node I was showing you before, because you have repeating patterns of follicles, as, as, as you've seen, you have a, a, a pretty, pretty uh, nice uh, uh, Clark Evans index. And if we just took the two different broad classes, a GC type and a non-GC or ABC type, and looked at the Clark Evans index, you can immediately see that there is a lot of heterogeneity across both, but that the GC type structurally starts to organize in repeating patterns that is much more reminiscent of a reactive lymph node compared to the active of the B cell type. And remember these terms actually are from gene expression, but it's kind of reassuring because those patterns that are seen in the real reactive lymph node are related to germinal center. So the gene expression pattern correlates with the morphologic pattern. So I thought that was sort of interesting and exciting. And you can see that even in the lymphoma so that the, the cells that are that resemble GC germinal center cells by gene expression are more organized than the 
non-GC or the ABC type, the NGCB is non-GC, the ABC type. Um, and so, and so this is going back to sort of that specific pattern. So we wanted to say, okay, we see these different patterns of immune cells, but are the content of immune cells different um, across there? And so if it sort of goes in the same order, if you read from left to right, that's the same here. So these are the ones that are really close and you can see that there's, um, um, uh, you know, macrophages, CD4, CD8 cells, um, and, and, and T regulatory cells, so the, the sort of cardinal phenotypes that are sort of interesting. And then you can see as you move across and get deeper into the tumor, D being the sort of in the deep core, you sort of see a relative depletion of macrophages and, and CD8 cells and a relative enrichment uh, compared to the other words in, in, in CD4. So maybe in F and, and D, so this is F and D, you see the CD4 enrichment um, and then relative, uh, and you see a lot of these, uh, these sort of different patterns as you move across. And so because this is multiplex and we have more information, um, you can actually look at what those patterns might be. So this is sort of sort of specific phenotypes now annotated based on, on, on the patterns. And these were in the, in the previous part of the talk where we, uh, which I didn't go into here, but sort of define these functional groups based on the known patterns of expression of uh, proteins on them. And so we, just to simplify, we sort of just regroup these, 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 all these things we call dispersed, which are up the first column, these sort of the cross mantle, this is that interface, we group those together here, and then the core, we just uh, call that the, the separate here in gray. And you can see, again, most of the interacting cells in this sort of activated immune area are CD8 cells, they're, they're KI67, which are proliferating, that the exhausted cells and the suppressive Tregs, those are really enriched at that interface zone, so between the tumor and the immune interface, where you're seeing a lot of both uh, um, activity of suppressive Tregs and patterns of exhausted T cells. Um, but then when you get into this, this zone here, you see depletion of those. And the only cells, again, that are sort of making there are, the, are a few of these um, uh, T regulatory cells and some of these other CD4 cells. Um, so to summarize this, um, we sort of created this sort of sort of summary model, um, and, and 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 I'll just pick out one example here. So um, we can do this we can do this for different phenotypes, but we can also do it for single protein markers. And one of the ones that came up um, was a CXCR3, and so um, CXCR3 is interesting because it is a chemokine receptor. Uh, and it's associated, it's, it's, it's expressed on cells that have an activated uh, uh, phenotype um, and, are, uh, and interact, and particularly T cells um, uh, that are interacting with B cells uh, have this pattern. So while in general, as you move deeper and deeper into the sort of the tumor core, you deplete all immune cells, the few immune cells that get there, um, and this is sort of greater interaction with the core, have increased in the amounts of CXCR3. And so based on this, now we can't tell which direction it's happening, whether there's chemokines being expressed in those areas that are drawing uh, the CXCR3 positive cells in there, or whether um, this, the, the CXCR3 expression is induced you know, but it's it's suggesting a very interesting hypothesis that could be easily tested, which we're, we're doing now in a, in a mouse model um, of if you wanted to get a, a T cell to penetrate into a tumor, this particular lymphoma, then, then, then you might do so by overexpressing CXCR3 or by modulating the, the, the ligand receptor to try to get those cells into, the, into there. And that's a really important um, issue, for example, for CAR T cells, you know, CAR T cells are highly effective for lymphoma. These are, you know, genetically modified T cells, but it's been shown that in patients who are resistant, that the CAR T cells have a problem penetrating into certain areas of the tumor. You'll actually see this very nice pattern where they let this infiltration of T cells around areas of B cells that have no immune cells in them. 
So, so one might imagine that if you could um, overexpress the XTR3, um, that might be a way to approach that. But you could do this kind of study for any um, other uh, uh, chemokine receptor that was of interest that you wanted to study. Uh, but it's only possible because you sort of established a sort of spatial pattern, right? And that was sort of the challenge for us at the beginning. So because we don't have the way solid tumors do, um, a sort of structure or there's no established patterning in structure, we had to actually derive that first um, from, the, from the single cell data itself to then sort of look at some of these patterns. And so to summarize this, we see that there's a, in the core area, we call it an immune desert, that this is relatively uh, more common in GCB type, right? And that goes along with that patterning that we saw more in GC type versus a more dispersed and immune active is more commonly seen in the non-GCB type or ABC type. Um, and that goes again with that pattern that there's less structure, it's more dis dispersed and, and associated with immune activity. And um, we see the amino phenotypes, um, the activated immune cells are out here uh, in this dispersed zone and they're depleted in the core. And that these immunosuppressive phenotypes with highly suppressive regulatory T cells and exhausted CD8 cells are really at this interface uh, between, the, between the two, which is consistent with what has been described in solid tumors, but heretofore not been described in lymphomas because of the lack of a structural sort of basis. And so here's this concept of immune penetration. Here was CXCR3 um, uh, being the only CXCR3 positive CD4 cells specifically, the only cells that are able to penetrate in that core area. And that's uh, from that data over here. So um, that's what I have. I left room for time for questions. This was work was done by a very talented uh, master student, Anthony Colombo uh, and Money Math, as well as helped by Eric. And this most of this work actually started when I was at SC, although I'm now at Cedars. So thanks to Peter and Jim, who were sort of instrumental to getting this uh, uh, first access to the machine, and and Imran, my pathologist collaborator, as well as our funding sources. So happy to take questions from the group. Yeah, I think the biology is super interesting. Um, yeah, I, I have quite a few questions, but I would like to have audience ask first. I think one already in the chat box. Um, so, Kayla, okay, if you cannot read, I can read for you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so the question is, why use N5 centered versus each cell as a point of reference? Um, so yeah, so if you were just trying to do the pattern, each cell could be fine. Um, originally, our idea was we wanted to be able to distinguish between, between um, cells that were sort of adjacent. So in other words, if you had an interface, whether you have immune cells and tumor cells on two sides versus an, a tumor cell that was surrounded by immune cells, then by comparing the centroid of five cells versus the distance to the nearest cell, you can try to distinguish those. Um, so that was that, that was the, the idea for, for that. If, uh, and so, um, yeah, so in a very diffuse tumor where there isn't much structure, it'll kind of come out to the same. Um, mm -hmm. You could just probably use, you know, a, a single distance. Um, the other question, confirm these dispersed Question, so do these dispersed core patterns are all within regions defined as, yes, exactly. So um, all of these regions would be considered to have tumor. Um, we, we ex if there was no tumor, we excluded them from the analysis. So these would all be considered to have tumor cells um, in them. Uh, uh, yes, exactly. <clears throat> so if anyone wanna ask questions, you can also unmute yourself. I see two more okay, in the chat okay. box. How do, mm -hmm. how do you control for variation in pre-analytic tissue processing, fixation times, et cetera? Uh, you don't, right? That's, the, that's what's hard about doing, um, you know, translational patient associated research. So 
what was the question is a great question. Um, there are some ways. So, for example, um, um, obviously, uh, your pathologist review uh, of the H and E section is really really important. Um, pathologists are amazing. I'm not a pathologist. I can actually look at the patterns of the tissue, the staining subtleties in the way the nuclei look to address if there was poor fixation, a lot of ischemia, et cetera, and you just avoid those, you get bad data from that. Um, that's, I think, probably the most important point. And then since, again, this is a tissue microarray, um, we select areas that are meant to be representative also, well, that can potentially have a bias, so that's sort of built into this, but we select areas that are, have good preservation to try to minimize that. And then, um, the question was, are they duplicate and triplicate? That's exactly right. Um, in this data set, uh, we, there are, there are about, about half of the cases are represented by duplicates. Um, for this analysis, we just combined all the data. We didn't treat them as, as separate, but, but that's, that's important. And it will be, I will say, so part of our problem is that diffuse large B cell is diffuse. If you have a tumor with a very specific architecture with a defined tumor and a defined stroma compartment, then I think you have to be deliberate about sampling. That, so for all of the work we're doing in, 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 in solid tumors, and, and we have a lot of, you know, I run the course with a lot of collaborators, that's exactly what we recommend. But if you know that there's a very heterogeneous pattern in the tissue, that's sampling. Um, and so that's what we generally recommend to do it to do it that way. Um, let's see, gosh, uh, other questions. Um, do you, did you not see any dendritic cells? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, was not in the original panel, um, uh, but absolutely is 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 critical because that's probably one of the main things that's regulating right infiltration of CD8 cells that's been described in others. So we definitely have it in our repeat panel, and help do a report on that. Um, uh, let's see, uh, we find segmentation of the diverse nucleosides of tumor very challenging. Um, yeah, so um, that is true. Uh, we, so in this case, because even though there are different sizes of the B cells, number one, they're, as you saw, they're pretty close to round, as much as round as a, as a cell gets. Um, so while they're a challenge because of density, and we do have challenges, I didn't go into it, there, there are overlap signal problems because of they're so tightly packed. Morphologically, they're kind of pretty close to round. And so most of these segmentation algorithms that sort of assume a sort of a round nucleus and or a membrane pattern. We also have also very nice membrane markers that helped us, but, um, I suspect whoever's asking this question, uh, uh, Dylan is uh, maybe doing like solid tumors where there's a big difference in size and that does become a challenge to do that. Um, uh, we, um, if you're gonna use elastic or, or, a, or a pixel classifier that, that, that or, or any of the, like the, there's a new algorithm like Mesmer that a lot of people that we were looking at um, that depend on good membrane signals, then we, include in our panels um, markers that are helpful for segmentation. So ideally it's a marker that is both useful for segmentation and biology. So for example, one I like a lot is HLA class one because in all the tumor studies, loss of class one is an important escape mechanism for immune surveillance. So we wanna have that in there, but it lights up almost every other cell type beautifully with a strong membrane signal. If you use membrane as part of your segmentation strategy, that's a good one. Um, but if you have an epithelial cell, with, you know, there's some other markers like the adictinin sometimes works. You know, something that's very strongly membranous. Um, people use the sodium potassium ATV as pump. That's also in the membrane. So it's worth reserving in your panel a few markers that help with segmentation. Um, yeah, and then the other thing is that uh, if you over or under segment, there's always going to be some 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 errors. So we just sort of the way you might do in flow cytometry, 
we just filter. So we have a, a, a cutoff for small cells and a cutoff for large cells, which may be under segmented. So we just filter them out that way. Yeah, also but, maybe I'll talk about that uh, in the <clears throat> first a couple of slides uh, I, I probably missed. Uh, so I think the, the tumor cells are uh, basically uh, also B cells, right? So they kind of carry B cell markers. How, how, how did you find, uh, how did you define their tumor versus uh, is a normal B cells in your panel? Right, so, so that's, that's a great point. Um, uh, we used uh, CD19, CD20 in this, pat in this one. I, there are other transcription factors with PAX5, they're diagnostic, but almost all of those are going to pick up normal B cells. Mm -hmm. so, um, um, so in DLBCL, there are not really normal B cells. You, I mean, everything that's yeah. CD20 positive is, but you are correct that strictly speaking, we would have trouble. And in fact, um, we have done some other projects on other B cell tumors where you do have a lot of normal background B cells, and it is actually a challenge to do. Um, we have started to incorporate um, information, like so what the pathologist does, right, is they use their morphology and the shape of the nucleus and the mm. nuclei and all this stuff, which you don't have here. You get some metrics. So we have a T cell project, which I didn't talk about, a T cell project that um, we're trying to look at the immune T cells in a T cell lymphoma. And there's enough subtle difference in the size that we use size to cut off, and that's mm -hmm. nuclear size. Um, yeah. So to look for the bigger and smaller cells, but it is it is a challenge. And you notice I did not talk about B cells because I am unable to sort of distinguish. But you know, mm -hmm. in review of the pathology, our pathologist tells us there's all tumor here, uh, yeah. and so, so. But but yeah, that that is that is a, a limitation. Um, in, in, in how you do, in how you approach that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in this case, I think a diffuse large B cell lymphoma, I think my pathology friends told me the same thing. Uh, if you pick the right region, they're all tumor cells. <laughs> they're all tumor cells and there really aren't residual um, B cells. That's the main thing is that there just mm -hmm. aren't normal B cells there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you do see there, are, sometimes you see, in, you see infiltration of other cells but I mean, you can do, you can, you can look Very at, CD20. I mean, you, I mean, so I didn't show, but look, if I just showed you the nuclear signal and mm. if you had seen the H and E, you can convince yourself that the cells that are stating the C20 are, have the really different nucleus from a mature B cell. Mm. Uh, but so we sort of randomly spot check it like that, but you're absolutely right in the clustering algorithm, it's not included. So mm -hmm. it, the clustering would not distinguish it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, in some, in, yeah. So, so if you get lucky, certain tumors have aberrancy, so you can use that. Um, uh, but, but yeah, it's 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 a challenge, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, I, I see more questions in the chat box. Although okay. I also have a few, but I will. <laughs> Were you able to corroborate the ABCGCB classic IMT orthologous method? versus IHC at this time of diagnosis. Yeah, so in this data set, we did not have genix. So this person obviously knows about how this is done. So our classification was actually done by Hans and we didn't repeat the Hans classification. We inherited it from the clinical data. So Hans is an immunohistochemistry version of the classification of GC and non-GC. We did not have gene expression data on this cohort. We have a new cohort that we're working on that has all of that. So we will be able to correlate that. And, and in fact, and if you've ever, if there are any pathologists who've actually tried to apply Hans, there's actually heterogeneity. They make it sort of black and white, if it's this or this, but there's sort of gray and heterogeneous expression. We would love to re-approach re Hans or Choi, any of these, 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 these IHC algorithms using a quantitative, because again, we have all dynamic range, uh, which I didn't mention, you know, compared to immunohistochemistry, which is very compressed. We have, you know, five, probably four to five orders of magnitude of, of, of dynamic range compared to, you know, half a half a order um, in uh, um, in IHC. Um, so we would love to sort of sort of maybe go back and 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 relook at that that way. But uh, we don't have that data to the 
this data set. Um, and then microarchitectures. Okay, so the question is the microarchitectures you described are centered on tumor immune distances. Did you find any recurrent architecture immune cell areas? Um, yeah, so we didn't look at it that way. So like an architecture within a, within a zone. So we, what we did is we used the immune cells to define, the tumor cells to define zones. And then we looked at the frequency and phenotypes. If I understand the question you're saying, were those then immune cells further organized? That's a great thought. Actually, we did not think, think to do it that way. Um, um, but you're right. I mean, that is the, the fundamental, right? The fundamental hypothesis is that structure, function follows structure, right? That in an immune cell, a structured immune response, and this is actually what I believe, I'd love to, a structured immune response is, an, is a good immune response and an unstructured, disorganized immune response is a poor response. Um, but uh, we, we actually weren't able to, to, to derive that in this sort of limited set, but that would certainly be the ultimate conceit of anybody who does this work, right? Is that you can set out the specific rules of structure. These are, this is the, this are the, the architectural principles for a good immune response and, and really just judge the tumor immune response based on how organized or disorganized or what pattern it has. Um, that, that, that absolutely would be like our overarching goal. And uh, we're trying to approach that by just getting more data. So, so uh, we hope to, uh, we should have uh, been very um, uh, open to any and all tumor types because, uh, because uh, um, uh, I think that's the only way we were going to derive sort of those broader principles. Yeah. So, in, in relation to that question, oh, I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah, great. After that, I can ask. Uh, okay. So, um, I think one of the images you show, um, like a, a pop of four or five kind of follicles there, but two of them give you kind of beautiful layer of mental zone, but the other two uh, quite diffuse, right? Uh, so that <laughs> uh, sort of further emphasize the importance of the structured immune response. Yeah, uh, I mean, so, so these are probably primary follicles, right? They've not yet had yeah. antigen, so that's mm -hmm. been organized yet. Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, so I wonder if you kind of further separate your spatial analysis uh, to those uh, sort of more mature kind of follicles with the mantle zone uh, and uh, the early uh, sort of follicles information. And uh, you, so you, you may have kind of better correlation with the outcome because you, you kind of mixed kind of two types of information together if you average over the entire field of view, right? Um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't follow. So you're yeah. saying? Yeah, for example, when you look at uh, the, the T cell, tumor cell interaction, sort of the micro architecture, micro community, right? right? Uh, so maybe there's gonna be very distinct micro communities in, in a so more mature follicle regime versus the earlier kind of diffuse follicles. And uh, if you average, you basically kind of lose that critical information there. Yes, yes. So, so um, right, if you, the, because, of, because of the averaging, the, the grouping by distance. Yeah, I mean, so um, yes, so we would, we, so we, um, part of it is also how well we define the immune. So we can actually, you know, we don't have to treat all. So I, I said we did it from B cells, right? But mm. we could actually start by saying KI67 positive B cells. So you could, you could add more information in that group and narrow it further. And, and I, I think that would maybe get at those different, or CXCR5 if I want to just look at mantle, right? So as far as we know the pattern, we could sort of do it that way. That's that's an that's an important thought. Um, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, we tried to keep it as simple. It's not as simple, but as simple. But you're right. There's 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 ways to sort of think about um, um, further being selective if we wanted to get a, a very specific pattern pattern out. Yeah, for sure. And uh, one. 
technical question, and another biology professor from here, the technical question is the antibody clones for checkpoints, it seems to be that they have very different performances, right? To capture the specific antigens and all these things. So how do you guys tackle that, especially for PD-1, you know, um, digit or the, the other markers, right? So you have, you have PD-1, PD-L1. Do you guys do some screens to find the best clones or how do you go with it? Like, you mean like this, just how do you pick good antibodies? Yeah, uh, how, especially for those that are controversial, right? Like right. you, we find some cells based on PDL1 or others, right? Let's right. say, but that will be highly dependent on the antibody. Right. Yeah. So PDL1 is tough, right? To, but there's a lot of work done. We used clone. So actually, that 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 paper that Imran presented at Ash was he I think used all five commercially available PD1 and looked at it, it, it across the cohort. So we used the uh, 288 clone, I think, from Apcam. Uh, fluid ion cells a different one for this application. Um, so we do a couple of things. One is we, um, in an early version of the paper, we talked a lot about how we set the threshold if we wanted to set the threshold. We basically now include, if we're going to talk about PDL1 as a biomarker, we include sort of commercial controls that are available because, because this is a big challenge. So there are cell lines that are engineered to express all variable levels of PDL1. You can buy them commercially and we just actually put them on the glass slide right next to it so they experience the exact same staining and antigen retrieval conditions. And then you can use that as a way to calibrate your, your sort of signal because the pattern, it's not distinct, it's kind of speckly and it's medium and low and high and it's hard to distinguish. It's, I think that's what you're referring to, right? It's not a, a clean signal. Um, so that so that we do all those sort of techniques that the pathologists do to sort of validate because that because you know they're making you know PDL one expression is used as a clinical prognostic di and a diagnostic right to, to treat mm -hmm. and so a lot of work has been done on the clinical side to standardize that so twenty eight eight clone is actually one of the clinically used clones so that's kind of what we do we take the cue we use the same reagents and controls that our pathologists do we make sure the staining staining pattern satisfies our pathologist. So I run this by the pathologist and he has to, to sort of agree that it's acceptable before, before we go we go, and that's kind of how we've approached it. Um, and, then, and then for defining, I, I didn't go into detail, but defining that triple positive, we actually did not actually make positive and negative calls. Um, I, I zoomed past it, but what we actually did was something similar to what's called an A score. We did an abundance weighted score. So we just took the intensity of PDL1 and the abundance of that, and made a sort of composite metric, and then just cut on that. So, sort of, so an expression median, high, and low. So, we didn't, because we actually, it's very hard to define that threshold of positive or negative. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, we actually had a lot of data. It's actually one, another version of this, this preprint that's floating around, but we actually had um, RNA. Uh, there's actually an RNA uh, in situ probe for PDL1 that's sold commercially. So we actually had RNA scope data on the same exact cohort. So, I mean, we felt really confident that the expression patterns were real because we had matching RNA data on, on the serial sections and we had done it with five different antibodies because that's what Imran's work was. Um, and it's really hard to set a hard threshold. So that's why we just try to, for biomarkers, we just try to avoid it. And just try to come up with some kind of non non threshold metric, um, but for for the biology where we call them positive or negative, we did have the threshold obviously because I called it positive. I can't remember what threshold we use, or we just probably in that case it was um, uh, it it was just like the cluster had distinct expression. I could probably pull up the heat map of PDL one on it. That's why we called it PDL one positive. We did not apply specific threshold to it because um, that's sort of more descriptive in that in that sense but you, you're right these are sort of the nitty-gritty challenges in, in, in yeah this. and actually you know, if i look at the multiplex protein images of these checkpoints most of the multiplex papers they show pd1 pdl1 ctla4 digit in different cells this is a multiplex technology you would expect that they will be in the same cell right so this actually confused me a lot, you know, why and how you're not getting in the same cell while 30 of them, 40 of them operate together, right? Right. 
Well, some of the multiplex, right? Some of the, 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 um, like the tyramide based stuff, they're just, they have a lot of steric hindrance, so they can't really show multiplexing in the same cell. They, they, they can show multiplexing on cells that don't co express stuff, right? They have that, that, that limit chance. But you're right. I mean, I hate to show like a zoom in photo of a positive or negative cell. You do that just because a reviewer asked you or you're trying to prove something, but we're, we're summarized. We just find the one positive cell, you know? Um, but uh, you're right. It, it, this is, um, so we try to be absolutely as, so in, 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 you know, in the supplements, you see, we like have all the patterns that we have and all the, the raw data, but, but this is the, the, the limitation for all this work, right? Mm -hmm. We'll just summarize it and the, the, how they've summarized and what they call the threshold and positive negative is really, uh, is really important and, and, mm -hmm. and the quality of it. And if it, if, we want to translate this clinically, which is mm -hmm. kind of right. I'm a clinician where I want to go with this. Mm -hmm. Then these questions about rigor and reproducibility are absolutely critical. And so we, if we have to choose something, we try to use clones that are clinically used. We try to use methods. So we, we've like, we're, we, we're exploring auto stainers and things like that to try to basically take cues from pathologists, use the controls they use, use the antibodies they use so that we're, adjacent to clinical use so that we can translate. That's kind of how we've done. Exactly. And another biological one, a quick one that will be, so those classifications that we talked about, right? Uh, ABCGCD, they, some of those are epigenetic driven, right? And there are mutations in epigenetic enzymes that drive some of these processes. And do we have any plan to relate this mechanism to what you observe here? And related or could be different, the CXCR observation, do you have any more plan to get into more cyclic in biology? Yeah, absolutely. So for the second one, the CXCR3, for example, we're setting up exactly mouse models. So there's a you know mouse model DLB. So that's the only real way to sort of get at it. Mm -hmm. And we'll try to validate that, that biological observation and other ones we've sort of seen the patterning. Um, epigenetic, um, we have, so these are big cohorts. So a lot of these have been done. So what I have been doing is co collaborating with folks who have done epigenetic, uh, genomic, gene expression, profiling of large data sets. And we're basically just trying to get all those samples in and, and do IMC uh, on them. And then we'll see if we can correlate. I mean, it certainly would make sense, right? Gene expression is likely, as you said, reflecting epigenetic states. And so uh, either mutations in epigenetic uh, or in things that mutations that control epigenetic machinery might be correlated or, uh, you know, epigenetic profiling, uh, certainly doing that in T cell lymphoma where that's very well described. That's exactly the project we have in T cell lymphoma. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, it's a, it's multi-omics, right? It's, 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 um, and some of these things we bring directly into the assay, like you can try to, look at certain methylation patterns because there's antibodies for it. And some of them we inherit as external metadata that we try to integrate. And, and, uh, and uh, these are obviously of great interest to us as well. Exactly. And Sanjay, I think, has a comment on steric hindrance. A bit complicated. OK, sorry. Steric hindrance may be a bit complicated. Cocktail staining based methods are likely hindered by the same amount of antibodies for finding very close epitopes in cyclical antibodies are stripped between the cycles. That's true. Uh, um, my understanding, yeah, so we have, we have, we've done those leave one out to see if we see any difference. And it's probably, it depends on obviously the, the antigen density and the specific protein to look at. We've never seen a difference. So and we just assume there really isn't seen it, or at least in cocktails we've used. Um, my understanding, I don't do the opal TSA termite base, but my understanding from those folks is that the hindrance comes from the covalently bound material that gets put down. That's where the problem lies. But I, I'm not an expert. That's what I was told, that, uh, but I'm not an expert in that. Yeah, system. I can clarify. I think, uh, sorry, Akili, I, I enjoyed your talk. Um, I am involved in some similar work over at Cornell and in, in, yeah. in nanopathology as well as a pathologist and, and working in imaging with opal. Right. And not IMC or maybe in particular, but 
Um, the opal steric hindrance, I haven't observed to be too big an issue, although it's hard to know uh, really to what extent there is some um, issue there. I mean, in chromogenic IHC, you really form an umbrella of chromogen where you can't get another chromogen at the same site if you're doing, you know, alkaline phosphatase and DAB or something like that. But opal, I mean, we, we, we've co-localized um, uh, antigens in the same cell with relative um, with a relative frequency. So, you know, you know, uh, checkpoint proteins on the same cells, I, I haven't had a, too much of an issue doing that. Uh, okay. but if there is some competition, I, I don't think we've done enough rigorous studies to evaluate to what degree there may be signal drop off based on proximity of two antigens, but, uh, certainly not to the extent that chromogenic IHC prohibits that kind of co-localization. Uh, we definitely see, you know, CD3, 4 on the same cells, 3, 8 on the same cells, checkpoint proteins on the same cells and uh, without too much difficulty, so. Okay, that's good to know, thank you. Yeah. Great, are there any other questions? If not, let's think for the speaker again. Thank you, Dr. Marshall, I think this was really helpful and great for our lymphoma biology also. <laughs> we learned a lot about it, thank you so much. Real pleasure. And uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to announce that next week we will have Dr. Uh, Liang Sai from uh, Gu, who's last famous, Liang Sai Gu from University of Washington. And he will be talking about dissecting behavior regulated transcription in the brain by pixel C. And with this, then um, we are wrapping up for today. Thank you guys for participating and please enjoy your weekend. Hope to see you next week. Goodbye.